Welcome to episode number 33. 33, that's the age that Alexander the Great died after conquering the world. And what have you done today? Well, as I sit here uh, in uh, lockdown for the uh, middle of the second week or so, it is funny, I've heard sometimes that actually humanity is always two meals from the brink of apocalypse. Uh, this morning, my coffee maker didn't work. And uh, the, the the fear that overcame me, uh, I mean, I can face the coronavirus. We've had earthquakes and aftershocks here in Utah, but no coffee. Come on, I can only do so much. Uh, actually, it's been nice in some ways. Today, I'm watching my grandchildren. Uh, they're walk, watching Onward as I, as I speak right now. And it's been nice to see so many of my friends and family members kind of inventing games to play on texts or there's a lot of FaceTiming and Skyping going on. Uh, I've often thought, and if you read 40 Years with a Whistle, it's one of my books, I talk a lot about how deprivation increases capacity. And if you don't have something, if your facilities aren't perfect, it makes you think, it makes you work, it makes you work extra hard. And I've always thought that not having the best of everything makes things better. I coached a football team for a long time where we had to take a bus from our school to the practice facility. Now, the bus ride went, lasted about five to ten minutes. Literally, it based, was based on traffic. But at first, I thought to myself, wow, this is a, such a pain. That's 20 minutes. And then I realized that it was five to ten minutes where I could talk. That walk it, talk it, chalk it aspect of coaching, I could do the talk it part in the bus every day. I could review the schedule. I could do all those boring things that we would go out on the field in a few minutes and do then. So anytime you see a situation like this where you've been restrained somehow, um, I, I tell you, as crazy as it sounds, there are times right after a surgery when I'm thinking things through again. You know, I've had a few surgeries in my athletic career. And when I start thinking again, it's, I can feel this wave of, of energy and, and enthusiasm again. I'm not saying folks go get surgeries. I didn't say that, but I'm saying sometimes not having everything reminds you about everything. And as optimistic as I am, I'm very concerned about me staying optimistic if I don't have my coffee maker working tomorrow. Time for questions. We got a question from Matt. Now, Matt only has one T in his name, so let's make sure we look at this question very closely. Doing a weekly training split with main goal is to improve sprinting and speed whilst using mainly kettlebells, barbell lifts around sprint session. If you only had five to six days per week to train, how would you lay this out? Well, if you're going to improve sprinting, let's just put that to the side, the, the, the weightlifting to the side. Because if you want to improve your sprinting, you you got to improve your sprinting. In uh, this week's Wandering Weights, I, I quote a great article by an Ohio coach who's a very good sprint coach. But I could also quote uh, Charlie Francis, the Canadian sprint coach, or Barry Ross. To be faster, you have to run faster. And the way most people do it now is they buy those speed traps. Uh, it's an electronic light. They're about they're about this high off the ground, and it flashes when you when you pass it. It flashes when you go to the end of it. Usually ten meters. You can go to twenty meters, and then it reads out a time. And your goal is to make that time be less and less and less. How you get there is how you become a better sprinter. Um, it's interesting because this Ohio coach, his his athletes only do three speed traps in a workout. Now, when you come from volume, 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 the American approach, and someone says they do three, you have to step back and go, wow. But then when you find out that his athletes are faster than your athletes, then you also have to stop and say, okay. So I would suggest, you can find them online everywhere now, but there's a, a series of movements. They're called sometimes... A step, B step, A, B skips. Uh, look up sprint training and take those 
warm-up sprint training movements very seriously. Strive for the best quality you can. Then I would set up a speed trap if you can. Uh, and if you can't, I don't know how to I don't know how to do this without the speed traps, but practice going as fast as you physically can. And then of course, you know, it might take you uh, 10 to 30 meters to get up to speed, hit that speed trap at 10, and then take 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 meters to decelerate. Had somebody asked me one time at a workshop about deceleration, and uh, it's interesting because in most of the sports I do, deceleration happens like this in an instant and that's a hard thing to train on the body so you <laughs> i keep thinking because mike boyle had just talked about the speed trap and i kept thinking well if you want to decelerate after speed trap just run into a wall then you don't have to worry about you know your your your, uh, your nervous system having to figure out what to do of course you would be you know not very attractive after a few weeks um in the weight room you're gonna to have to keep it simple. Uh, easy strength is based on sprinters workouts. Easy strength is based on track and field workouts. It's a deadlift and it's a press. Basically, that's what I'd like you to do. As, as a sprinter, uh, it's gotta be a big hinge movement, probably a press movement, and then something like an ab wheel. Um, don't overthink the weight room. Uh, you are not gonna be an elite sprinter doing curls because you run like this. That's all reaction, not action. If you're going to, you've got to focus on speed on the track and the weight room is a great supplement. A couple bits of advice. I suggest you look up Barry Ross's Holy Grail of Speed article. Uh, that's when we worked with uh, Alyssa Felix. And of course, any of the work by Charlie Francis. Uh, what you're going to find in both cases is that the great sprint coaches don't care what you do in the weight room as long as you don't keep changing things in the weight room. I found that fascinating uh, because what you don't want with sprinters is soreness. You don't want delayed onset muscle soreness with sprinters because that soreness cuts into your speed work. Uh, Matt, it's a complicated question. It's, a, it's something that literally takes a few years to, uh, to adapt and accommodate and develop, but I gave you the broad strokes, and it's going to be up to you to figure out the other stuff. We have a question from David. I had a question regarding rest periods and having to really compress them during training. It's amazing how many rest period questions I'm getting. Uh, I have an article on T Nation uh, where I go through rest uh, quite clearly. Uh, the first one I talk about is eternal rest. Trust me, David, there will be a time where you get all the rest you'll need. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have a garage gym, but over the past few days, I found that I'm having to train later at night after our six-year-old is in bed. And it's funny you said that, David, because as I read that, my six-year-old granddaughter started to cough and coughed again. Due to it being later in the night and having to still wake up fairly early for my work, 5 a.m., I'm finding that I'm compressing rest periods during my 60-minute park bench workouts and finishing the day's training somewhere between 25 and 30 minutes, depending on the day. Uh, by the way, David, this is the tradition of weightlifting, and you're doing the right thing. I'm not following any specific rest interval. I just listen to my body and go on to the next set or exercise when I feel that I am ready. I'd love to hear your thoughts on using little, uh, little to no rest, I think, and how that affects training results. Uh, David, I absolutely applaud what you just wrote here. That's what I think you should do. I'm not a big fan of time rest periods unless it's a training program that demands the rest periods. Uh, I have one called the transformation period, uh, a transformation program where you might do a set of overhead squats for eight, rest exactly a minute, overhead squats for eight, rest exactly a minute. And in that state of fatigue, overhead squats really hit you hard. You do the last set of eight and you base your load only on that last set. Most people way overload on this because the first two sets are easy. I don't care about the first two sets. It's the third set. So David, I think you're doing something that's very wise. Um, Bob Guida, Mr. America with his program called PHA, Peripheral Heart Action. 
he essentially said to do what you just said, uh, same work, less time. A reminder about what density is. Density is a word of in, we use in training. Um, here's the amount of inside my uh, my hands are time, and inside my hands is the work. So what you want to do is a couple of things. One, you can do more work in the same amount of time, which doesn't seem to be the option for you right now. Or David, what you're doing very brilliantly, same amount of work, less time. Now, David, there's going to come to a point where you constantly compressing is going to not be any value anymore. Uh, that's why it's so important. If you're using the generator, when it says to slide up to say, uh, for example, three sets of 12, that's going to change everything for a bit. And that's going to probably make add some time to your training for a while. That's okay. You're going to need some variations in reps and sets over time to to keep working the density. Uh, if you never stop moving in a workout, I can guarantee the loads and the reps are just way too light. So just kind of keep that as a reminder, okay? That is a great question, David. Thank you. We have a question from Mike, but he tells us instantly, it's not a question, but might be fun to share. I bought your book, Never Let Go. Thank you. I don't like when people steal my books. Great stuff. Started with front squats, uh, 10 pounds for eight sets, eight reps with 10 seconds rest between January 12th, 2020, um, between on January 12th, 2020. March 13th can do the sets with 100 pounds. That's all I do. I do it again when I can walk. Everything is getting thicker. I was 224 on January 12th. Today I'm 202. Well, so uh, for those of you who don't know the book, Mike is using a variation of what I call the Tabata front squats. And yeah, that's all my fault. All that Tabata nonsense, you can put, once again, you can lay that yoke on me. I read the Clarence Bass article about Tabatas. Uh, I had only 165 pounds to train with. So I started experimenting with the Tabata protocol with weightlifting. I wrote some articles about it. A certain group of lunatics took it and ran with it way too far, and this is all my fault. Part of my time in hell will be for the Tabata workouts. But I came up with this variation because it's real hard uh, to do the 20, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. So I came up with a little variation where you do eight front squats, rest 10 seconds, eight front squats, rest 10 seconds. So on the first two rounds, your front squats might take you uh, like eight to 14, 15 seconds, but then you just get a 10 second rest period. You do that for eight rounds, 64 total reps, and it is an absolute eye opener. And as our friend Mike tells us, uh, and if you look at that body composition changes, that's all he's doing. Folks, maybe we found the holy grail of fat loss right here. Um, Mike, not only would I want feedback from you, but other listeners, if you try this, which I think is brilliant. Now, you can see there's going to be an end on this. You're not going to be able to do this for 40 years. But if you try it and you get some success, let us know. I think, Mike, you might be on to something here. Got a question from Oliver. After 10 years of working out, manual labor work, and guitar playing, that's an interesting combination right there. I hope you don't do them all at the same time. Some days my hands feel pretty beat up. Are there any exercises you can recommend to help my hands recover between activities? Well, uh, I just the other night, uh, Garth Brooks had a uh, special on Facebook and they asked about how long he'll play. And he said, uh, as long as his fingers hold up. And I thought that was really interesting. Uh, you said hands. Now, there's a couple of things there. As a, It's funny because as a strength coach, do you mean the ability to take rips and tears on calluses? That kind of thing? Or are you, do you mean basic hand stuff? Okay. <laughs> well, that didn't come off well. Um, so let's just talk about this kind of thing. Uh, calluses and blisters and stuff like that. Um, my coach, Dick Notmeyer, was a huge believer in something called corn husker lotion. And uh, back when Eric and I would train, you know, when you're snatching and cleaning and jerking, 
three days a week doing front squats, snatch grip deadlifts, never using, ever using straps. You know, my hands were just destroyed. But the idea is if you get corn huskers lotion or a very, any other thick, it's got to be thick that you can rub in. That seems to be the best thing I ever did for my hand care. Um, as for the hands and wrists, we do a number of things in our, in our gym. And let me just show you the, the fundamentals. When I first started Olympic lifting, people would tell me, well, the reason the front squats hurt your wrist is you need wrist flexibility. And they would tell us to do this stretch here. And that's great until I later found out because of that surgery um, is that actually there's a band right here. And so I, a martial artist taught me this wrist stretch where you put your pinky on your sternum, you grab your thumb and hand, and then you drive, you drive your wrist down your sternum line, your belly button line. Okay. And that stretches this part. Well, when I started working with the material of Steve Ilg, I-L-G, he started reminding us that we should do stretches this way and stretches this way. Um, if you look at some pictures of me online, there's one meme that says push-ups, you're doing them wrong, and I'm doing a push-up with my hands on the ground this way. Well, it's not a push-up. It's a, I believe it's called the cobra, the downward dog to the upward dog. We do those cobras or pumps, as they're sometimes called, in this wrist stretch position to get more flexibility in the wrists. So if it's the condition of your hand, corn huskers lotion. If it's uh, wrist flexibility, think about these drills I just showed you. But I wanna add one other thing. Make sure you're working your joint mobility. So you can do something as simple as thumb loops, uh, wrist loops, and go both ways. And it's kind of nice, there's no cracking today. And then these individual finger loops. Now. It doesn't seem like much, but a lot of people, this is the first place arthritis gets in, certain kinds of arthritis. So I'm not sure this is going to, I don't think it's going to prevent arthritis, but you'll certainly get some insights about where you are on the condition of your joints by doing those. So I reviewed skin care, basic wrist flexibility, and basic finger, thumb, and wrist mobility for you. I hope that helps, Oliver. We have a question from Taylor. Are there any boundaries of how long of a pause to take between reps on the mass made simple squats? Um, as someone who's done them, uh, and, and my friend Brian is on the other end here, uh, the, the, I have taken a long time. After rep 30 uh, on my way to 50 or 51, uh, I would think that there's times when, I, I would not be surprised if I took five, 10, maybe even more, uh, I, I was gonna say breaths of air, but it's more gasps of air. I can remember Eric Supert and Dick Notmeyer both standing there that one time, and Eric is just like, take your time, take your time, get all you need. And I went down, ground back up, and then Dick said, 31, which was great to hear because I only had 19 more reps. So yeah, the, you, you take what you gotta take. Now the only thing is, Every moment you're standing there, that's time under load. That's why I often recommend don't get cute on those numbers. You know, if you weigh 165, don't toss 395 on it and do a set of 50. Stick with the weights that I prescribe. On sets of 30, a couple of breaths at the top feels nice between every three to four reps. Is that cheating? No, I stop at every rep. God put me on the earth to be, to be explosive, not to do high rep squats. He then says, or should I try to piston everyone straight through? You know, that, I tell you, Taylor, if maybe you did this a few times, and that might be an interesting goal for somebody. What, well, check that. That might be an interesting goal for somebody else, because I'm not going to do that. But that would be a really interesting thing to do in a training program, is to try to go through all 50. Boom, 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 boom. Um... I can guarantee if you can do that, there's a lot of other magical things you can do also. Um, but generally, when you're doing Mass Made Simple, stop and breathe as often as you need to. That's why those workouts called up to 50 are so important, because it teaches you basically where you're going to be in trouble on the big 50 sets. Okay. And then two follow-up questions. 
Also, can you recommend any bus bench program that focus on loaded carries? Um, well, the only thing I can do is, if you don't mind, if I could uh, share my experience when I first started doing them, um, what I began to do was because of the situation with the yard I had at the time, is I would leave the I could leave the sleds out there, I could leave the big bags out there, and only had to carry out a little bit of stuff. So basically, I wouldn't say it was a bus bench program, but I would take the stuff out there and just do it every training session. I would I would mix uh, Highland Games throwing uh, with different drills and I brought the Olympic bar out too with snatches and cleans and then made sure I did loaded carries every day. I don't have a bus bench program because Taylor the key I think with bus, uh, with loaded carries is to have as much variation as your capacity to think of variation is. And if you come up if you come up with an idea and you do it and it's a miserable failure don't tell anybody. But if you come up with an idea that's brilliant, share it with the world and give it a cool name and name it after yourself. Um, but the key to loaded carries is always change the distance, the load, uh, the movements as much as you can. Uh, that's And that is a hard thing for people, I think, in 2020 to understand because a lot of people have been kind of spoon-fed programs their whole life. You know, you get the Muscle and Fitness or Men's Health magazine and, you know, you want titanic trapezius is in six weeks and they have 73 different exercises and none of them are snatches and cleans uh, or you know tremendous triceps or you know you know whittle yourself down for bikini season you know doing you know doing lunges and those burpees that they always show in men's health when it comes to loaded carries the advice is yeah do them yeah whatever you got any way you want to do it and that's not comforting for a lot of people. Lou Schuler wrote a very good article in Men's Health a while ago. He quoted, uh, uh, what's that guy's name, Dan John, uh, quite a bit in the article, which I thought was brilliant. Um, but basically he gave a whole bunch of variations and then kind of stopped there and didn't give too much about programming. The key is, <laughs> the programming is two words, do them. Um, and he follows up why he asked this question. I'm looking for something to program that is outside centric for the warmer months. Um, the best advice I can give you, put your stuff in your truck or carry it outside or however you do it, go out and just whip up some fun uh, outdoor workouts. Um, on both Dan John University and danjohn.net, there's a thing called the Coyote Point Kettlebell Club. It's a 51 page thing about our experiences of just inventing workouts together as a group. Feel free to use that for help. Daniel asked, that's a beautiful name, is there a kettlebell version of Mass Made Simple program? Uh, no, uh, but maybe I can spitball something for you. Let me read the whole question and I'll get back to you. I have a lot of kettlebells and a month off work due to the current situation. He's a PE teacher. And I thought this would be a good time to bus bench it. Well, we did try something called Lean Made Simple. And if you're on the university, you can go to Slade Jones's uh, Lean Made Simple program. But I mean, here's an idea. And, and I'm not sold on this by any means, okay, Daniel? But you seem like a nice guy and you have a great name. But maybe uh, focus on I would say single arm presses, uh, probably something like two, three, five, ten. So on your left, do a set of two, right set of two, left set of three, right set of three, left set of five, right set of five, left set of ten, right set of ten. Two, three, five, ten. That's going to give you 20 reps. Um, I would like you to do them in half kneeling because of the because of what it does for the the hip stability and stretching the hip flexor and, and all and, and even the balance. Um, I would alternate that maybe something as simple as do a round on it the first day. Do so that's a total of twenty reps. Do two rounds the second day. That's forty reps. Three rounds the third day. That's sixty reps. And sprinkle in one, one 
five round day, which would be a hundred. And I don't know where you're going to do that, but you'll know it's the day we have tons of time. Maybe after that, do the, what I call the armor building complex. Uh, that's two double kettlebell cleans, one double kettlebell press, three double kettlebell front squats. Um, the armor building complex, uh, I would suggest maybe doing 10 rounds of that every workout. That's it, just 10 rounds of it. Every, just make that what you do. Um, from there, uh, maybe you should try just the goblet squat, high rep goblet squats. Uh, 50 reps with uh, 50 reps with a 32 would be difficult. I don't know how much harder that would be than 50 reps with the body weight back squat, but play around with some ideas on the high rep squats. Uh, it comes down to just three parts then, Daniel. The half kneeling presses, the armor building. Oh yeah, there's a lot of presses here. Yeah, sorry. And then the high rep goblet squats. Uh, I'd love to see you build up, really build up on those goblet squats. Travis. I had a great experience doing the 10,000 swing challenge. Yeah, you know, good. I, you know, Mike Brown and I, uh, who, by the way, just called me, Mike and I worked really hard on that program. The variation you got in T Nation was 40,000 reps of experience. I write the article, and not eight minutes after that article is published, people have better ideas. Ah, oh, that's when I realized that most people are just full of crap. I did it as written in the T Nation article you wrote uh, using the four suggested strength movements. I did the whole workout staying in the Maffy Tone zone. Oh, okay, uh, for those you might forget, Maffy Tone's numbers are 180 minus age is the highest your heart rate should go. 160 minus your age is the lowest your heart rate should go in a workout. And I, I do think this workout would be very friendly to the 10,000 swing. Uh, Maffy Tone and the 10,000 swing challenge are very friendly. The first workout, I had a time of 52 minutes. And the last one, I was right under 29 minutes. 29 minutes. That is, that's impressive. Generally, I wouldn't, getting it under the mid-30s, uh, I would just worry about your technique a little bit. But let's not worry about that right now. Uh while running no more than 15 miles a week, I went on to PR my half marathon by five minutes and really enjoyed the race and did not push hard at all, it's, which is exactly what Maffy Tone would have told you was going to happen. Uh, that's, it's nice to see this confirmed. During the race, I felt like I had great heart and lungs for it, but I could tell my legs were undertrained, and he responds, because they were. Uh, doing this challenge reignited my love for kettlebell training. I felt like I had a suit of armor under my skin uh, after doing 500 swings a day. Yeah, I, I know what you mean by that. With you doing the 10,000 swing challenge, I, I, one thing I wish you would have included is what bell you were using uh, during the 10,000. Because when you mentioned that you're using the, 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 the 53, the, the 24K bell, um, that got me thinking is maybe your time was so fast because you're using maybe a 16 and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a piece of information I'd like to have. But I'm really happy to see that a sensible strength program with a sensible running program ended up you get a new personal record. That makes me feel better about humanity right now. Thank you, Travis. Well, once again, thank you for listening. Now, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I do my best to answer every question that comes in. Uh, I also ask for feedback. And boy, I tell you folks, if we can get that feedback loop going, it helps everybody a lot more. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.